Anyway, uh, back to James. Um, we we've got some responsibility uh, carrying a handgun. Uh, what uh, is, is if let's just say we're in the right and we have to defend ourselves and uh, put somebody down? What what's the first thing uh, we need to do uh, relative to law enforcement? Do we talk to them? Do we not talk to them? What how, how are we supposed to behave? Can I back up just a little sure, bit and absolutely. set some context on this? Uh, most people think they know what self-defense is. And the fact of the matter is they do not. Uh, the first thing we tell people is the worst sources of information for what you can and cannot do when it comes to a self-defense situation, particularly when you start uh, introducing the possibility of lethal force, is police officers are, are a terrible source of information. Most firearms instructors don't know which end of a horse got up first uh, when it comes to when you may or may not you know, sure. pull the trigger. Pull the trigger or even ex let people know that you have yeah, a well, weapon. That's the other thing. <clears throat> that's an implied threat as soon as you, yeah. as you brandish, is it exactly. called brandishing? Pull your coat open yeah. in the wrong circumstances mm -hmm. and you could be charged with kidnapping, armed robbery, uh, you know, ag assault, and not to mention that you then create the justification for someone to shoot you. Yeah. So nice. it, it, it's a complicated subject. It, it really is complicated. And uh, juries are notoriously stupid, to, to put it quite bluntly, when it comes to self defense issues, uh, particularly now. Uh, because the world has changed so much that they introduce all sorts of cultural issues into this that have nothing to do with the legal aspects. But it's who you are, where, and when will influence how the jury sees your use of lethal force. Of, of force. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. and th that's why we tell people stay the hell out of this, You know, get, get out of town, do whatever you have to do to avoid this. Sure. So number one is avoid conflict if possible. I exactly. We, in fact, our strategic window is what we call ADRE. Avoid first, de-escalate if you can, retreat even though you have no duty to, get out of there, back off, let them have the field as long as you can safely do so, and that the very last thing you want to do is engage. Now, I'm not saying there aren't lots of folks out there that don't need killing. <laughs> yeah, right, right on. But we don't need to Let be the me ones give to you a it. list. That's... <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, you see, well, okay, I like yeah. this guy, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, you know, the, the avoidance and retreat, those are terms that are oxymorons to the words Don McDowell, just so you know. And, and to most stand-up guys, they are. Uh, Don was there in that class when I talked about one of the hardest things you'll do is to stand down. It's and it, it will, yeah. like, if you're a personality like mine, I'll seethe over that for months afterwards at the injustice. Oh, yeah. You know, so, um, but back to your, now that we kind of set this, sure. a, a basic global framework, when it comes to law enforcement, there's a lot of debate about that, whether you should say anything or not say anything to the police. Most people will tend to talk too much, and that's your greatest danger. On the other hand, you don't want to just clam up completely. You want to be polite and if you can't be polite, at least be civil. Um, Nothing inflammatory. Yeah, don't say what you did. Say what they did. Exactly. Okay. Okay. You can point out evidence, but don't touch anything. If they give you a piece of evidence, for instance, a drawing or a photograph, and ask you to point out the thing, don't do things like that. Don't do that. Uh, and tell them very clearly that you are invoking your right to silence, and you have to say that now. I am invoking my right to silence, and I want to have an attorney present during questioning. I will be glad to give you a statement, but I will do so, say, in 24 hours when I've had a chance to call, calm down because I'm shook up right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I want my attorney there, and let them know that you're not trying to hide anything, that you're willing to cooperate, but you, you also want to protect yourself during that process. Okay, now typically, what is the... I mean, we, we understand that police officers, you know, peace officers are really what they are. Supposed to be. And, and supposed to be. Um, you get the image through media sources that if you don't 
try and cooperate with the police immediately, you're hiding something. Is that the attitude that the police officers have, or is that just general media BS? A good many police, unfortunately, have that attitude, and they will try to intimidate and get you to, you know, to uh, to talk to them mm -hmm. because they're not there as your friends. That's not their no, job. No, no, they're not. They're not your friends. You have you are responsible at that moment. You're your own first responder in that crisis. You just need to be quiet. Say the things that I told you. Let them know you will be talking to them. But the fact that th now I don't want to offend any police officers out there, and I wore the badge a long time, so I don't have a problem with that. The cops are just cops. That's all they are. Oh, I know. They're errand boys with guns. They're there to take reports, to clean up the mess. That's that's it. Now, they are going to try to intimidate you into making it easy for them to make an arrest because their career depends on that. They get a little tick mark on their sergeant's office or whatever. Don't let them do that to you. You have to just hold the line and know what your rights are and just be quiet. And it's the hardest thing that citizens can do when they are really in a moment of trauma. Because well, you're emotionally charged, uh, you know, the uh, yep. exhilaration and, uh, you know, everything else. The adrenaline, Release the adrenaline of adrenaline. adrenaline. Yeah, you know, I mean, if that gun comes out, holy cow. Yeah. Frightening. So, yeah, we, the, the police, don't let them intimidate you into making, doing something stupid. And... and Unfortunately, a lot of them will try to do that. And what do you care if they think you're hiding something? It's not up to them anyway. It's going no. to ultimately be up to the prosecutor. judge, yeah, prosecutor, and then a judge and jury. Yeah, yeah. It's like Ron White said: I had the right to uh, right to silence. I just didn't have the ability. That's exactly you know, right. I, I love that guy. <laughs> yeah, that's now. Understand, you're going to lose your weapon. No, they're yeah. they're going to seize that as evidence. And, yeah, there was another fight. Yeah, and in a, it probably the majority of circumstances because the cops are different now, the law is different than when I was on the street. You're probably going to get hooked up. They're going to put you in irons, and they're going to take you down and and book you, or at least take you to the station dinner to try to do an interview or whatever. For questioning. Be quiet. Just be quiet. Live through it. Make sure you have your attorney there. What are your thoughts on concealed carry uh, insurance, regardless of the source? Is it, is it a good idea or no? You know, your, your civil liability is actually more extreme than your criminal liability. Mm -hmm. um, oh, absolutely. And so insurance is a good thing. You don't, want, you don't want to make the down payment on your attorney's new Mercedes and no. uh, be paying some dirt bag forever. Um, Attorney and dirtbag, they came out in the same suit. Did you <laughs> yeah. hear that? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> just I told you he was PC right here. <laughs> so, yeah, no, in insurance <sighs> is advisable. If you have something to lose, protect it. Yeah, okay. All right, that's good. Yeah. Unreal. How big is your staff at the uh, Weapons Academy? Right now, I just have one other guy. Um, back when I was doing this full time, I had 14 instructors on staff. Holy and, cow! Yeah, it was, it was we rock and roll. I mean, I competed with Gunsight, and uh, oh boy! So you know, it was it was a friendly rivalry, but uh, oh sure, yeah. Well, there there there's a lot of guys out there that uh, know a lot of stuff. But looking at your uh, your resume with your law enforcement, because we're we deal with a, a lot of guys that are former military, and that's it. You know, they 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 want to come into the uh, civilian setting and uh, share their skills on how to keep, kill people and break stuff. And uh, that's not always the case. And, and that, that was kind of the lure of, of your class with your background, the law enforcement aspect, the military aspect. You know, we, we're talking about strategy and, you know, the situational awareness. The, we'll, we'll get more on that. Uh, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of violent crimes are happening in parking lots, and uh, you know I'm trying to get across to the uh, the people in, in, in my life that uh, you know we're not going to have a gunfight at long range. It's going to be, you know, in an office setting or a home setting. It'll be tables and chairs and doors and walls involved, and you know you're not going to be shooting a hundred or a thousand meters. So it's a hand-to-hand -hand situation. Uh, it, 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 that's where we live. 
That's interesting that the term you used there, and I was glad that you introduced this opportunity to talk about that. Okay. You're a martial arts guy. Um, I, I used to be for many, many, many years. Um, don't do you that still much. are. I don't do much of it anymore. My body just won't take it. Well, like, like me, you had it beat into you. It yeah. doesn't go away. But it just takes us longer. It, it does. But it's, um, it, in my personal view, that is probably the biggest hole in most people, even people that take security seriously. The fact is that you need to have empty hand ability or expedient weapons ability because the, this firearm is such a liability. I, will, I would much rather take somebody out, you know, by taking out their, their trachea than yes, pulling sir. a gun on them. Yep. But people don't, they won't invest the time in, into doing what's necessary to keep those. Now, your comment about uh, how much do you shoot, um, I've had to learn something in 50 years of training weapons. Even if I was an idiot, you, you learn something. Uh, I have found, and you know, speaking as a former you know, statistics professor, we run all of our courses in only three-hour blocks because it has been my experience that if you're not a 20-something Green Beret or SEAL, after three hours, all you're doing when you're shooting is making noise and your skills are actually degrading. Yeah, eroding. Yeah. So we keep it to three hours. And especially for citizens, and that is plenty. And they need, because I train horses, training shooters is very much the same way. After you've had a session of instruction and disciplined practice, you need soak time. You just It needs to just seat. You don't need to be doing it. You right. need to be doing yeah. other things and give yourself some downtime and then come back. Thank you, Professor. You just verified what I've been trying to say all day. So. You, you need to go at the range more. Yeah, yeah more often. I certainly have. And what, what that. he's alluding to is after you shoot your a lot of block of ammunition, you put your put your weapons down, go out and have a hot dog and a Coke, and just sit there and soak on it. <laughs> I totally understand. <laughs> How do you uh, uh, approach teaching from a military standpoint, which is your background, and, and there, there's a uh, that's ingrained at this point. It's like kind of like martial arts and military stuff. Uh, you have it. You're not getting rid of it. But when you have to sit down and teach a civilian uh, class, you're, you're, you're teaching to a different choir versus uh, soldiers or Green Berets or SEALs or whatever the case may be. Or even law enforcement. How do you pro approach that? It took me a while when I first started teaching, when I left the military. Um, and law enforcement, and I was teaching in law enforcement because I was in law enforcement as a collateral. There was a difference between a military group of elite warriors. Now, I'm not talking about line units. I didn't do that. I taught, you know, I was fortunate enough to be in spec ops, so you're dealing with a different caliber of personnel. But there was a dramatic difference in what they could withstand just in pure endurance of shooting. <coughs> the police were a far cry from that, they were way down, and citizens were much further down. And I had to learn some things and unlearn probably more about how to handle citizens. And if, if you don't mind me being a little pedantic here, Don, I always correct people, and I don't mean to be correcting you, I but I do not like the term civilian. A civilian is, a subject, is subject to martial discipline of the government. A citizen is sovereign. So when I talk about those issues, I'm very careful because precision in language reflects precision in thought. So I always use I that like term, him. citizen. That was awesome. Citizens, okay. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. I like that. So, yeah, yeah. I, I teach citizens because they are sovereign. I Remember stand corrected. Us. Thank you. All right. You're, you're, so, uh, uh, yeah. Well, the uh, re reason I ask that, uh, you had a task uh, at Desert Breeze when you taught your uh, – Lethal Force class, there was a mix of men and women uh, from various backgrounds. There were some military guys there. There were some first responders, uh, a couple of firefighters, uh, some former cops, uh, current cops, and just some guys that were there were hanging out, soaking up stuff. So the, the task of getting, the, getting their attention, keeping their attention, dealing with the myriad of mentalities 
men versus women versus, you know, different skill sets. Pretty interesting. You did a good job. Well, thanks. But that's where the art, teaching is more art than it is science. And when you go to so many of these courses, they're what I call the Denny's of shooting. <laughs> you know, what it, your hamburger will taste the mm-hmm. same in Philadelphia as it does in Redondo Beach. Sure. Um, I have probably given my, def- well, that lecture you came to. I've given that lecture probably five or 600 times. I have never given it the same twice. So teaching as I told my, when I was developing instructors for, for weapons, I don't teach this class. The class tells me how they need to be taught. Okay. The feedback you get from them determines which Just direction you language, go. Because yeah. every class has a personality. Mm-hmm. And if you can't make that adjustment, and if you come with a canned approach, you will get a canned response. We run at the academy, back to that question you'd asked, I have Tim... My coordinator. Nice guy, our, yeah. Our, yeah, our training coordinator, uh, Phoenix Fire Captain. Um, he teaches the introductory classes because I just don't have the patience for it anymore. You need to come in there with a basic understanding of how the weapon works and safety and that sort of thing so we can get going and do stuff. But the issue of wives and kids goes back to the philosophy behind the academy, which is we are our own first responders. If you have a significant other, you have to say it that way now, Mm -hmm. that is not a weapon-carrying team member to you, if they're not part of the solution, they are part of the problem. Exactly. Children. Every child should know run, hide, drop. And those should be three commands that they obey instantly without question it may save their lives hide run drop one of those depending on where yeah, you are let's say you're in a a, a mall and yeah. something ugly is going down and if you're going to be engaging you're the bullet magnet your child drop and you're moving away from them so that the, you know if bullets are coming they need to come at me not at this child but that child needs to get down low and do it unquestioningly do it now Hide, when I was teaching principles, use that term, when I was teaching principles in protection, the hide command was for their children to either, like, typically under the bed or into a closet, and no matter what they heard, no matter their parents are being, you know, butchered, they were not to come out. It may save their lives. So, you know, know, security is a family business. It is. It needs to be. Well, the, the, the interesting thing is that you point out uh, if the significant other isn't uh, a carrier, uh, really is part of the problem. It, a huge problem. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I don't have kids at home, so I don't worry about stuff, pa- you know, bullets passing through drywall, things like that. So, you know, that, that, whole, that whole scenario is uh, something to, to think about. And... Every member of the family should know the difference between cover and concealment. So if something goes down, they know, don't hide behind the potted plant. Get behind the pillar. Mm -hmm. You know, and people say, well, you're making them paranoid. No, you're making them competent to withstand and to survive in a a situation. Me, I'm going to stand behind JK. There we go. (laughs) Because I am a real readily available target. (laughs) Hey, I've got a question, James. I'm going to go out and venture to say that most people can't really shoot very well as it is. And then you consider the heat of the moment. How do you replicate, um, you know, that situation uh, to teach somebody how to be able to concentrate and shoot well in the heat of the moment? It is It is a long-term process, and it's what I had alluded to earlier. I've been through, I can't tell you how many immersion-type training scenarios where you're just shooting all day for days on end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you come out of there at the end of that time with some pretty hot shot skills, and within a week, you can see a noticeable degradement. Absolutely. That is why that the comment I made earlier about frequency trumps duration. It just takes a long <coughs> time, and tying that in again to the change in our weapons platform, why we go with the striker fire double stack weapons now with 9 millimeter. 
our standard at the academy is, is if, you, if you cannot make a 35-yard body shot consistently under stress, you have a lot of work to do because, unfortunately, that's where you may be needing to shoot at least that far, yeah. off the parking lot, down a mall, because if they get inside a 35-yard arc and they have an explosive vest, you're done. Mm-hmm. So I, I know people think that's extreme, but if you train for that and never need it, what have you lost? It certainly means you'll be able to deal with lesser level threats. And it's the methodology. Too much training today is what is what, from a learning standpoint, is algorithmic. It doesn't work. Algorithmic means if then. It, it's like remember in martial arts, Don. The old way of teaching martial arts, you would say, okay, if the, your aggressor does X, you do Y. Well, what happens when he does X plus four? Oops. And you haven't trained for it. Yeah. That is why we follow, and it was based on my martial arts training and being having the privilege to be mentored by Robert Koga for 40 years, is that we I concentrate on fundamentals. If you hammer the fundamentals into a Thank student yep. so that their muscle memory is autotomic, you know, the kinetic memory is there, so that even when they're falling backwards off a loading dock, they can draw that weapon and employ it, they will be able to adapt to any changing circumstances because the infinite, the universe of, in, of possible scenarios is infinite. You cannot train for the scenario. You train to the fundamentals and then rely upon the amazing power of the human brain to adapt that fundamental instantly to the situation. That's the difference between a mature shooter and, and those that do the if-then thing. doesn't work. Got that? Duly noted. Yes. So if you don't have the time, literally, to give to that kind of a perfection of a skill, do you advocate that they not use it at all? No, I think you go as far as you can. Okay. Do the best you can with what you've got where you're at. That's Teddy Roosevelt. Goes back to your bicycle thing. You're never going to forget how to ride your bike. You're never going to forget how to fire a 38. No, never. <laughs>